to talk about, um, if I had thought about the economy, what is the key challenge facing us? It's growth, but largely to create jobs. So this is going to be the focus of today's talk. If we look at our growth rate over the past, that's from 1970 to 2010, the red jumpy up and down line is pretty much our growth rate. Um, and you can see we had real problems in the 1980s. That was the Sorrento riots. The Asian crisis brought down our growth rate in 1998. And then basically through the 2000s, we had a pretty good time. We had strong growth going just about to 4.5%. And then we had it crashing with the uh, global financial crisis. That's pretty much where we're at. And the other line, the sort of straight line, that's our GDP, gross domestic product, per capita, per head. And that dipped through the 1980s, but then rose again. But notice, we are still below. The peak today is still lower than it was in 1981. So we've improved, but we've got a big problem. And the big problem is unemployment. This is South Africa over here, corner, and there's three bars for each country, and each one is going up. Basically, it's showing that from 1990 to 2010, most countries in the world have had rising unemployment. But ours was high to begin with and rising. And we are high relative to just about everywhere. Iraq, I think, has got a higher unemployment rate. But I mean, we're doing pretty badly internationally. And the club that we like to think we're part of, the BRICS, we've got a massively higher unemployment, we're much, much closer to the mixed market economies, pretty much Spain. And one of the similarities between South Africa and Spain is very tough labor laws and strong regulation of the labor market. So, this is the graph in another way, but I want to make a point about this. The dark bars are employment. So you saw it dropping, then rising through the 2000s, dropping a little bit now. And the empty bars are our real gross domestic product. <coughs> we've got employment dropping and then rising, and we've got growth rising. But if you look at the two together, what that's telling us is that since 1990 to now, for each additional like, job, we're creating more output. Or, put the other way around, for each additional piece of growth we've got, we are creating fewer jobs. So we've got rising labor productivity. Each remaining worker is producing more output than in the past. But this is not helping us overcome our employment problem. So we all like the idea of productivity, but it's not necessarily what you particularly want if you're trying to strong productivity growth to absorb all those unemployed. So what that, this is all from an index point in 1990. The top line is labor productivity. Output per worker has been really rising so has real average remuneration, that's a red line underneath it, that's real wages. So where real wages have been rising, but productivity has been rising faster, which is good for business. You know, if, you can, if your workers, their wages are rising, but you're getting more productivity out of them, actually that's good for profits, so that's the next one. Third line down is the profit share tourism. But employment hasn't bounced along, come back, come down, while unemployment rises with population growth. So if you had to stand back and ask yourself, what's happening in this economy? We've got some winners. The workers whose way, who are still employed, whose wages are growing. The firms that remain in business, that have got the more productive workers, are doing well. Their profit share is rising. But it's been at the cost of firms in the labor-intensive sector, the ones that have more workers per output than anywhere else, and firms um, not supported by government, industrial, or other supportive policies. So we've had a whole lot of government support increasing over the last few years, which has been supporting firms in the high productivity sectors. Those in labor intensive sectors are less likely to be supported. So let's have a look at the two good policy documents that have come out recently. So we had the new growth card, Abraham Patel 2010. They were aiming to create 5 million jobs by 2020. It's kind of a mix here of direct government job creation, these are all good things, you know, the public works programs, he had this, they spin the idea of a youth brigade as well, a whole lot more support for labor market policies, that's much more around training, all good things. Industrial policies, that's trying to pick winning sectors and target them. And then there's kind of loose talk really about social democratic consensus building, even a mention of wage moderation. We need to keep wages growing, but they've got to keep in line with productivity so we don't squeeze profits too far and kill investment. You get that in the new growth path. It's got a lot of other nice things. We hear more and more these days, green 
in the, uh, the green economy, knowledge intensive growth, and a big plug for the developmental state. Uh, you read Ibrahim Patel's document, it's very much about government driving you know, our whole restructuring of industry in more capital intensive and uh, productive ways, labor productive ways. Then we had last year, end of last year, Trevor Manuel's National Development Plan, which has a slightly different tone, but it pretty much endorses, it builds on that new growth model. So instead of 5 million jobs by um, 2020, we've got 11 million jobs by 2030. Same thing except he's really punting for education. So this, this one really pushes education much more. Uh, very green economy, black economic empowerment. But again, there's a lot of vague talk about mobilizing all sectors of society to convince South Africans of the need to make mutual sacrifices for long-term benefits. Lots of talk in here about hard trade-offs. But nobody ever actually says, well, what is the hard trade-off we're talking about here? What are we talking about? Not clear. What are the limitations of these two? They're very interesting on many levels, but for me, they've got some problems. The first is that they require unrealistic economic growth rates of between 5 and 6%. So remember the picture I showed before? That red line never got anywhere near 5%. This goes from 1970. So we're going to have to get on a growth path that we haven't seen since probably the mid-60s for a couple of years. So that, that's the one thing. So we need to, there's going to be some sort of shift that has to happen um, in the economy. And it's rather unclear how we're going to bring that about. Right. So 5 or 6% depending um, on, um, on whether you are going to grow labor intensity or not. If you're going to get more capital intensive, if you're going to have more and more output per worker, we're going to have to have rates of 10% to reach those job creation targets, sorry, 6%. But if we're going to keep where we are without getting more capital intensive, it would be 5%. But, you know, it's just unrealistic. Our investment as a percentage of gross domestic project will almost have to double from 17% to 30%. And our savings rate has to go from 15 to 25%. So it's a nice vision, but how realistic is it? There's also an emphasis on decent work with no mechanisms about wage moderation. And this is what worried me the most about the National Development Plan, which had many good things, particularly the focus on education and on building state capacity, by the way. That was another good one. But notice what it says there. It's a quote from page 126. Currently, South African manufacturing strength lies in capital-intensive industries. In a context of high unemployment, growth would ideally be sourced through expanded contribution of labor. So they're recognizing, ideally we should be going for those labor intensive things. But, note the bold. However, to compete, the country's cost structure requires an emphasis on productivity, products, and logistics. In other words, we take for granted we have a high cost structure. It's like, you know, we have Table Mountain, we have high wages. It's just there, right? It's got nothing to do with us. <laughs> and, and then we have to kind of move on. And so, given that cost structure, we then have to like build productivity. And move on that. <coughs> so it's kind of, and, and that's in both of these two documents. And this is probably a political decision um, in reference to the strength of the labor movement in, in the government. But this is what I want to talk about. It really comes from costs. So let's talk about what is a labor intensive industry. So I talk about the clothing industry. I'm doing some work on this. There's a current court case around this. Very interesting. This is a picture. It's not a very good one. But of a, a very, it's a sweatshop. This is in Newcastle. It's a Taiwanese-owned firm. Um, and these are all exactly the same piece of clothing. Women are arranged in lines. They're producing precisely the same very simple product. And each, uh, each um, person does like a sleeve. And she puts it in that box and gets moved down the line. So those boxes contain the outfit. That's a very cheap way of making jobs. So if you took these data come from 2008. I feel like that was our last manufacturing census. To, ta to, to create a job in manufacturing in, in general, it's 150,000 rand. You have to invest 150,000 rand in machinery in general. But if you take the clothing sector, it's 10,000 rand. Basically, you can get, go a long way on very simple machines. But that kind of production, 450 rand a week, which is below the national minimum as legislated by the clothing company. So this is kind of, you can't quite that this is sort of a, a representation of a one of these labor-intensive factories. Starts off with the materials, there's a cutting table, 
and it goes down the line. Different machinists doing different jobs. You have different kinds of sewing machines. And you can either run it like a kind of a waterfall from one table to one table to the next, or you can feed to groups of women. It's mostly women, there are some men. But that if you if you're paying piecework, that allows you to the more productive um, of your workers to, to actually produce more and get higher wages. And they, those workers get much more than the minimum wage, but not everybody does. But that's the kind of thing you get. And it ends up in a bucket right at the end tagged. So you go and visit these factories in Newcastle, and what you find is the tag at the end has got Mr. Price. That's actually a skirt, a gray skirt. It's got Mr. Price tag on it. It's 99 rand. The middleman who took the job to this particular factory gets 50 rand. And that factory gets 10 rand, which is actually quite a lot. Most of the time it's 3 rand to 5 rand, sometimes it's 10 rand. So that's the sort of margin you're getting from this sort of firm. Right, but what is a capital intensive clothing industry? You've even got capital intensity um, inside the clothing industry itself. Notice the overhead rails. So here we have um, a woman, there she is, she's got a sewing machine, and this is an overhead rail system which takes different kinds of clothing. See, there's, you can do different orders at the same time to each person. And it's much more, it's much more, um, the wages are higher. But these particular clothing are in niche markets. They're not your Mr. Price kind of clothes. This, in fact, is a school uniform supporting bishops and sacks, in fact, that the blazers are made. So if you've got a niche market, you can pay higher wages, um, and you're more productive. But you're getting a lot of labor productivity through extra machinery. And the bargaining council tends to favor and dominated by these sorts of firms, and they set the wage that the labor intensive firms can't pay. So we did literally got, if you think about it, this is average earnings on that wages going up here, labor productivity there. The, the sort of Taiwanese, mostly Taiwanese owned firms, which are paying 450 Rand a week with some extra productivity bonuses, are down here, low wages, low labor productivity, producing basic stuff. And then you've got the higher wage, higher value added for the top fashion industry, much more. They're there. And essentially what's happening with our labor regulations is that we set the wage there and we push it across there. We say we only want decent work. Now my point about looking at this is that these firms are not in competition with each other. They actually aren't. It's not as if there's a race to the bottom, that if we didn't have the wages, in fact, these, this, these two firms are across the road from each other there's a particular market, which is for basic goods that you get in Mr. Price, jet, happiness. and then there are the niche markets and the high fashion goods, which you get somewhere else. There's no reason why we can't have a whole range. It's not as if you need to have a high wage to stop some sort of race to the bottom. We can work on a whole different set of clusters of firms. So what happens when we start pushing the wage up on these firms? So if you were, say you were just under the minimum, and you have that kind of production line, and you decide you need to try and pay the minimum wage, and you're going to get a grant from the Industrial Development Corporation to do that, they will help you buy a big buttonhole machine. So instead of just having one little buttonhole machine here, this could be a multiple one. And then you put people together in groups, um, and you buy slightly better machines, which have they trim it as they go, so that you don't need the trimming machines down here. And you end up with a much smaller set of people and you have higher productivity. This is what our industrial policy does. It's saying we want to move from there to here. And we spent a lot of money doing that. We gave one billion rand to 100 firms. Rob Davies actually announced this a couple of months ago, which is 200,000 rand per employee. Now remember my number. That's twice the amount that you need to create a job. So we are throwing tons of money to try and make everybody look like the top end, even though we've got lots of people who want to buy the basic goods that are produced by, by Mr. Price. And if we drive out those firms, Mr. Price does what Mr. Price does now, which is imports from China. So do I have from Newcastle, China, chuck out the Newcastle firms, okay, China. So it's not as if we're even protecting South African jobs, we're actually just opening ourselves up for Chinese imports. So this is what's been happening in clothing. That is formal clothing going down from about 2003. The National Bargaining Council was formed in 2002-03. And since then, we've had a steady drop in employment. Now, that's not just because the wages have risen. See, this is wages here, in the wage rates from the, from the time we started, rising very sharply. 
But that's one of it. What we did is we subjected firms to a perfect storm of rising wages, and we opened up tariff barriers, and in came imports from China. So we had competition from China anyway, and we had rising minimum wages. But what's really interesting to me is, is that we are able to, a whole, there's a whole chunk of our industry, the industry that I was showing you pictures of, that are ignoring the minimum wage. They're just hoping it's going to go away. They just carry on. They were there in the old apartheid days, the decentralization areas, and they just kind of hope that maybe somebody will just let them continue. They have been competing with China. You know, our retailers can buy from whatever they want to now, but those guys are still competitive. What's making us not competitive with China is our own laws, which are saying, no, we don't want those jobs. We only want everybody to be at the top end. And now what's happening, and there's a court case I was mentioning, several of those Newcastle firms are taking um, the bargaining council to, to court on all this. They're saying it's discriminatory. Uh, because the bargaining council in the last couple of years has gone on a compliance drive. They've actually targeted the firms. They've, they've seen them working there, and they haven't wanted to push the minimum wage, because they know these are in really deep rural areas, this is the only source of employment, leave them alone. But actually now, with the strength of industrial policy behind them, saying, well, we'll support the firms to move up the value chain, get more productive, they're trying to shut down a whole bunch of firms. So a lot of the, the, the drop here of firms that, that were dropping anyway, and then about a quarter of those that are left, are essentially threatened by these drives. So for me, what are the lessons? The clothing sector, well, we can compete with China. So whenever you say, we can't compete with China, we're wrong. We have, we are competing very well with China, actually, on something like the clothing industry, if we allow those wages to come. <coughs> we can grow, I think, employment at the top end and the bottom end, because they've catered for different products and part of the markets. And it's actually causing rising capital intensity, and it's not helping us get to those targets of getting to um, you know, those 5 million jobs by 2020, etc. So this is my final thought here. What do we do? How do we make the economy more conclusive? Inclusive basically means we've got to give, get people access to, to income. So about a third of the labor force is work. It's 25% if you have a strict definition, 33% if you've got a broader one. Um, 28% of the population gets government grants, which is incredibly high for a developing country like us. We've got a welfare system that's unprecedented. It costs 3% of our GDP, and yet, we still are, there's no support for the unemployed. You only get it if you're unemployed and you've got a disability grant. So, my final point is, we either have to expand the welfare to, to provide support for everybody, which means we all have to pay more tax, or we should actually grow the labor-intensive activities 